So Neil Gaiman tweeted this. For extra credit, Encanto is Lin-Manuel's company, discussed with a special reference to Mirabelle and Bobby's respective journeys. Now, as this is about Encanto and Lin-Manuel Miranda, and about finding the hidden connection to Stephen Sondheim's musical, Company, I couldn't ignore it. A musical theater challenge from one of our greatest storytellers, Neil Gaiman? The king of fantasy books? That's right, the Coraline Sandman guy who literally has his own storytelling masterclass. I'm Neil Gaiman. And this is my masterclass. Not only could I not ignore this extra credit challenge, I knew I had to dive headfirst into this and show my work. Because the answer to this prompt hits a lot closer to home for me than you might think. Neil Gaiman, here is my extra credit assignment. But first, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon's everyday earbuds are my go-to earbuds whenever I want to immerse myself in a cast album, which is saying a lot because the cast albums are sometimes pretty long, which means the earbuds have to be comfortable for them to stay in my ears for hours. But they are, and there's a reason for that. They've got these optimized gel tips, which make them fit perfectly so that they're comfortable, and those very same gel tips are also designed to keep those earbuds firmly in place so they will stay put even if you're on the move and they stay powered on too 8 hours of playtime 32 hours of battery life and they sound fantastic too they have three sound profiles to fit whatever you're listening to whether it's a podcast or classical or hip hop and they have a noise isolation setting which means that when you turn it on you can block out the outside world and live in a musical and they do all this for half the cost of other brands. And they still have over 49,000 five-star reviews. Best of all, if you click on the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash Howard, you get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Yep, 15%. And you'll be helping out my channel as well. Thanks, Raycon. And with that, on with the video. Now first I want to start with my initial reaction to Neil Gaiman's tweet, which was that I already had made a small connection between Encanto and company through their use of names. Lin has said that he sometimes chooses names based on their rhyming possibilities. For example, in his first musical, In the Heights, he gave one of the prominent families the name of Rosario. Why? He writes, they've always been named Rosario because it rhymes with Barrio. And he mentions how Sondheim chose Bobby as the name of the main character in company for the way that name had lyrical possibilities as well. Bobby. Bobby. Bobby, baby. Bobby, booby. Bobby, Robert, darling. Continuing with the name games, Lynn is also partly responsible for Bruno's name, which he used in order to justify the lyric. We don't talk about Bruno, no, no, no. Bruno's name is originally listed as Oscar. The filmmakers, however, wanted to change it, and so they gave Lynn a few options to choose from, one of which was Bruno, and that's the one Lynn chose. But then I ended my reaction with a big question mark. But then he asked about the relationship between the journeys of Mirabelle and Bobby, and I'm like... In truth, I already had in mind a connection between Encanto and Company. And it's not about how certain songs in Encanto and Company resonate, like how We Don't Talk About Bruno has a patter section. Just like how Company's Getting Married Today has a patter section. Pardon me, is everybody there? Because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate you going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do and not a word of it to Paul. Which actually makes for kind of a fun mashup. Through the fear, we're stuttering, you're stumbling. I can always hear sort of muttering and mumbling. I associate him with the sound of falling say. Or Ali Weiss Klinger's theory that in company, Bobby's friends are all married, except for Bobby. Just like how the Madrigals all have gifts, except for Mirabelle which is actually something worth exploring because this was the exact metaphor that takes my theory about Mirabelle not having a gift but instead finding purpose in being the conductor of the family Madrigal's many gifts and binds that theory together with a metaphor that was used in the 2006 Broadway production of Company where everyone in the cast is playing a solo musical instrument except for Bobby, our main character, who can barely play a kazoo. <laughs> That is, until the 11 o'clock number, Being Alive, where Bobby finally gets to play piano, an instrument that typically provides the accompaniment for all the other solo instruments. 
And for another thing, what about the fact that both Encanto and Company feature birthday candles? In Company, it's the candles on Bobby's 35th birthday cake. In Encanto, it's a magic candle that forms out of the grief of Abuela, who has lost her husband Pedro, which, according to Encanto director Jared Bush, actually happens on the same day as the birth of her triplets. So it's also their birthday candle in a way. But what I think ultimately connects Encanto and company is hinted at in Gaiman's own prompt, the idea that Mirabelle and Bobby share a similar journey. There's just one problem. Their journeys don't seem very similar at all. Mirabelle is trying to keep her family together and heal the cracks as the magic of the casita is falling apart. Bobby is just trying to survive a surprise 35th birthday party and relive various vignettes from the past. Encanto comes from the perspective of a child living in a fantastical version of early 20th century rural Colombia, while Company comes from a very adult perspective in a realistic world of modern late 20th century city life. In in some ways, the two are polar opposites. So what Gaiman must be describing as their similarities must be happening on a deeper storytelling level. And I believe it has to do with the relationship of our main character to their community. In Company, that community is a group of married friends who have decided to throw a surprise 35th birthday party for their unmarried friend Bobby, our main character. In fact, the idea of company is even foregrounded by the title of the show, being a word that means a group of people, but is also commonly used in theater to describe the ensemble players of a musical. And in company, our main character is Bobby, who is unmarried with no emotional commitments, and who acts as mostly our window into the lives of this community of married friends. This is because Company is actually a compilation of 11 short one-act plays by George Firth, which are plays mostly about a couple with a third wheel or outsider who acts as a catalyst on that couple. To unify these 11 stories into a musical, we realized that what the plays had in common was this couple and this outside person, and that maybe if we could make the outsider the central character, uh, we would have a reason to amalgamate. And we ended up with five couples and the outsider named Bobby. And thus it was born. And the framing device for the story would be Bobby's surprise 35th birthday party. Happy birthday, Robert! In which all Bobby's married friends get together to be a catalyst for Bobby, who then comes to the realization of the importance of wanting... Want something. Want something. ...to be loved in the 11 o'clock number being alive. being alive. So in essence, the story is about Bobby, a catalyst for a group of friends, a chosen family, if you will, who then come together to become a group catalyst for Bobby. And similarly, Mirabelle is a catalyst for her family. I would heal what's broken. Though she wants to heal what's broken, she really means she wants to heal herself and get a gift just like everyone else. But in her quest to prove her specialness, she becomes a catalyst of change for everyone else in the family, from holding Antonio's hand in his ceremony, to validating and hugging a stressed out Luisa, to bringing out Isabella's true colors, to finally giving Abuela an outlet for her pain, to playing matchmaker for Dolores, and to reintegrating Bruno back into the family. But at the end, the Madrigal family comes together to become a catalyst for Mirabel, with Antonio holding her hand this time, and everyone giving her the doorknob which will give her a second chance to receive a gift from the casita, which actually works and restores the casita's magic. This narrative structure of a person who helps a group and then that group returning the favor and helping the person even works for Abuela's story too. Abuela was the one who raised her family to help the village until finally in her hour of need, the village comes back to help Abuela rebuild the casita. 
But what makes Encanto even more of an achievement for Lin is that he saved the Madrigal family with his songs. That's right. Disney wanted to cut down the family because I remember we we were talking to people in the studio about this movie and they said, I think 12 people in a family is kind of a lot. Maybe it should be four. And it wouldn't be the first time Disney was scissor happy either. Eliminating family members was exactly what happened on Lin's first Disney musical, Moana. When I was hired for Moana, Moana had eight brothers. Those brothers went bye-bye because Moana had a world to save and we didn't have time. We have no time for the brothers. Let's go. In Encanto, Lin was determined to prove the power of musicals to save the family from the chopping block. And Lynn said, how about I write that opening song where I introduce everyone in the most entertaining way possible and you're gonna fall in love with everybody. And that was the first song written for the movie. That's why we have all the characters in the movie because Lynn went and wrote the song before we actually had a movie. Because to Lynn, the big intergenerational family living under one roof was essential to representation. It goes back to family. That was like, we kept circling like how much of like the complex dynamics of, of an intergenerational Latino family can we put on stage. In fact, it was so essential, he even wrote it into the lyrics of the song. This is our home, we've got every generation. But it wasn't just important to tell this fictional story. It was important to represent a real Colombian family, like the one my cousin's Colombian husband, Jose, grew up in. Hi, how are you? This is Jose. At least once a year, Jose and my cousin Ting visit their family in Colombia, who still mostly reside in the small mountain village they all grew up in. I grew up in the in the mountains in Colombia. The name of the town is called Santa Maria, and the name of the state is Huila, and is 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 the southern part of Colombia. There are like four generations there, like living together in the same village. When the Encanto team initially visited Colombia to do their research, we went and visited the Cocora Valley. They visited the Cocora Valley, an area of Colombia that can be found in the same tropical zone as Santa Maria if you travel north along the Andean mountain range. And on Jose and Ting's most recent trip, they found that their relatives took pride in the film Encanto. I felt like there was a lot of like excitement with the movie from uh, the, the family that I spoke to. I think they're just really excited and proud to see their country being represented um, in a good light. They all knew the songs, yes. And to give you another idea of how Encanto is received in Colombia, here's another family member who works for the Colombian airline Avianca that now flies Encanto-themed planes. And undoubtedly, one of the things my Colombian side of the family connects to is this portrayal of the intergenerational family and the importance of the matriarch. The role that the ladies play there in their family is very crucial. In that sense, the movie is <laughs> I suck it, you know, like the kids have spent tons of time with the abuelita. But I have a question for you, Howard. Don't you kind of feel like when you are watching the character development in Encanto that it almost reminds you of like an Asian household, like how we are raised. Yes, I too grew up in a multi-generational family with my grandparents living at home alongside my parents. And truth be told, I think the story resonates for a lot of people across many demographics because of its honest portrayal of these complex family dynamics which Lynn knew not only makes for good representation of a Latino family, but also would make for good musical theater. After all, what are typically the big musical numbers that end a show? It's everybody singing and dancing together on stage at the same time. Music allows for and gravitates toward having large groups of people singing together united. That's why musicals will often focus on these large ensembles or companies and audiences love to experience that feeling of many people as one. So perhaps saying Encanto is Lin's company is even more appropriate for the way Lin was actually responsible for maintaining the focus on a community of people, just as Firth and Sondheim had focused on in company. So Neil, how did I do? And everyone, what are your thoughts about the possible Encanto company connection? Leave your thoughts below in the comments. Thanks for watching the video. I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon, including my newest patrons, Stacy Belair, Teresa Novak, and Duckstream Media. Subscribe and see you in the next one. Peace.